I must admit, I am shocked at the numbers. I was thinking there's about 40 members of staff coming. And, uh, and I have been in 60 days. It does feel like I've been there a long time. Um, I think the first four or five weeks we agonised over the bio that would be written for me. I wish I'd get that copy. I think that <laughs> makes me feel much better. Um, so I think the first thing to say is just as the backdrop for this, uh, and I love the hashtag, hashtag here, we are international. Bristol's an international city. And we can unpack that in many different ways. Um, but um, I just thought it was really important to just to make that statement, and I don't want anyone uh, to leave here under... Um, with any doubt of the intention of myself and uh, Hugh and, and other people around the city to make sure that, that that description of Bristol remains true. And if anything, while the vote to leave the EU brought us many challenges, um, as I was just being interviewed downstairs, I just thought actually one of the, one of the things I think it has done is, is uh, ensure that many of us don't take that for granted that you can't take an appreciation of difference and diversity and that internationalism for granted is something that we can't just relax into, but we actually proactively pursue it. And I, and I say proactively pursue it because I don't want to talk about defending it. That's negative. That's, we, we pursue our internationalism um, and we build it um, day by day. Um, a bit of my personal story uh, may... Um, uh, you know, may bring some colour to that. And, and I do kind of enjoy talking about my own mixedness. And I, it's a term, I, I, I'm a mixed race man. Uh, I, my father came from Jamaica when he was 12 years old. My grandmother came first, was the usual pattern. No, sorry. My grandmother came first, was the usual pattern. Left my father in Jamaica with his grandmother, my great grandmother. And then once they established a base, they send for the children and they and they all come over. So my dad came over as a 12 year old in, in the 60s. My mum comes from two lines. One is from South Wales, that then goes back to Ireland. My grandmother was an O'Brien. I don't know where she came from in Ireland, but I know she was an O'Brien. My great grandfather was a five foot Welshman called Tallybach, who worked down the mines. And uh, I think my family were actually quite open. My mum tells a story of remembering uh, black American GIs in my grandparents, in my Welsh great-grandparents' house during the war. But I do wonder if my great-grandfather would have looked at me and been surprised. <laughs> this was his, uh, you know, his blood coursing through my veins. Um, so, okay, and then on my, on my nan's side and my white nan's side, my family or a family called the Briars who go back in Bristol a long way. And uh, I did meet a police officer a few years ago uh, and I was telling him, I said, and he happened to mention a couple of places, and I said, oh, that's where my family's from, the Briars. And he said, the Briars? And I said, yeah. He said, Len Briar? I said, yeah. He said, oh, he was a, he was a villain. <laughs> but he said he was a gentleman, though. <laughs> so colourful past, right? <laughs> but that mixedness comes together in my, in, in my blood, and it's something I've celebrated and I've enjoyed. And uh, actually... Uh, as mentioned, I, was, I had an incredible opportunity to spend some time at Yale University a few years ago. And uh, on my program, in my year, I had some incredible people. I had Lumumba Diaping, who was the, um, sort of the uh, UN diplomat for Southern Sudan. I had Alexei Navalny, who was my next door neighbor. He's the guy who Putin's arrested uh, for blogging and uncovering all the fraud. So it was nice. In my campaign, someone tweeted me, good luck in Bristol Mayor, with 1.2 million followers. And my press officer said, someone's tweeted you. He's got 1.2, 1.4 million followers. And it was Alexei. So it made me feel good. <laughs> so he ran for mayor of Moscow and lost, and Putin's arrested him. And, um, so I had some incredible people um, in my uh, program. But when we introduced ourselves, um, with this amazing international collection of students, um, I, I ended up talking about my own mixedness and how my mixedness had shaped my my worldview, my understanding, what it felt for me growing up in what I'd call a racial limbo, an identity limbo. So when students were being given, or kids around me were given easy shells for their identity, um, I, I couldn't fit those shells. And I told the story of once in the 1980s when Bristol had the riots. That, um, so I grew up in Easton, very, what you might call, black area. It wasn't a black area. It was a very mixed area of poor whites, Asian and black. Um, but my friends were predominantly black. And uh, someone said to me, so Marvin, in a war between black and white, whose side are you gonna be on? 
It's this kind of existential threat moment, like, wow, you know, where, where do I fit within? Because I'd experienced being chased down the streets of Bristol by calling me names. Um, so, I, you know, I was contending with this thing of identity and belonging uh, from a young age. And I told that story, among a number of other stories, to my, my fellow Yale fellows. And then a woman called May Ackle, who's an incredible woman, works in politics in Lebanon, worked for the, for, for the um, prime minister that was assassinated, so she's a real high flyer. She, she said to me, Marvin, you just told a Lebanese story. And when she told her story, she talked about being uh, Lebanese, so both her parents are Lebanese, but her mother's Jewish, her father's Christian. And some of her mother's sisters have married Muslims. So she says, I've got Mus cousins called Muhammad, I've got cousins called Moses. And, and so we started you know, working with this idea that maybe people of mixed heritage, people whose parents come from either side of some kind of divide, be it racial, ethnic, religious, national, have a unique but as yet untapped contribution to make to the way we, we do politics and policy around identity, conflict, peace and reconciliation. So what, what is it? You don't have to be mixed to, to have that, but this idea of how do we build a society across difference? Because my difference does not divide me. Being, if I celebrate my Jamaicanness, it doesn't mean I'm less Welsh, it doesn't mean I'm less English. If I celebrate my Welshness, it doesn't make me less Jamaican. I'm all of those things. And one of the questions we started to ask ourselves was, can you take those kind of insights of individuals that are not torn apart by their difference and blow them up to a societal level? Whereby we learn the skills of living together as groups, where we have coherent senses of identity, but we, but we live across our difference and our dynamism within that. And we said, we were, I, I pitched it to the BBC at one point, they turned it down, anyone who, oh, no, no, they don't get it sometimes. But, um, I, you know, I don't know how to turn that into policy right now, but what I will say to you that that is, and, and, and it's not a pledge of mine from the election campaign, but what I will say to you, it's in the spirit of, the, uh, it's in the spirit of leadership that I would like to see in Bristol, not just in myself, but across all the institutions that shape life in Bristol. Because it's one of my key uh, commitments and, and attempts to, sh to share with Bristol that life in the city is not shaped by city council alone. Life in Bristol is shaped by the collective decisions of all the institutions across university, health, criminal justice, private business, local government, voluntary community sector, faith groups, we all share. And what I'm hoping is that, that, that over, the coming, over the coming years, we can develop a culture whereby we recognize our diversity as a strength, we welcome it, we don't try and pretend that we're not different. I don't try and pretend I'm not Jamaican or Welsh or English, I say they're all true. And, and sameness is blandness, right? We want that diversity of thought and we know that those of you that will be in uh, business studies or, or academics will know that we say that diversity of thought creates innovation, it creates dynamism, it creates, you know, it's what the world is made of. So I want that in Bristol. And um, we have that in our wider population. And I think that the role of our universities, our faculty and our students um, are absolutely essential to making sure that we have that, that we have that in Bristol. And like I said, that diversity is not just racial, it's ethnic, it's national, it's class-based, it's gender, it's sexuality, it's, it's people who are disabled and people who are not disabled. That whole range of different ways of seeing the world and understanding the world is absolutely essential. And, and uh, I, I spoke at the launch of the Disabled People's Manifesto yesterday, and what I want to say, it's not just a nice to have. It's not about if we do this, we'll all feel warm and fuzzy and, and so forth. It's about having an economic and a political advantage. Right? Um, there's a fantastic paper, if any of you read it, it's, it's, by, it's about IBM, it's called Diversity as Strategy. And IBM made lots of money about harvesting the diversity of thought among its staff. It was on the front end of being able to hoover up um, contracts when the federal government in the United States started to make access, accessibility a key requirement for federal contracts. So they, they knew that already because they'd been harvesting the thoughts and the insights of uh, disabled people who were among their staff. They hoovered up lots of money. They were able to, to get access to uh, small and medium-sized women-run businesses because they had women among the senior leadership who understood the market. And, and, and I think that's, not, that's something that we could think about not just for um, individual organizations, businesses, that's something we should be thinking about for whole places such as Bristol. Yesterday we had a meeting with the Chamber of Commerce and um, it came off the fact that I had attended a number of uh, local enterprise partnership meetings where I think I was the only person in the room, perhaps one other, with brown skin. Um, 
and fair enough to the, J James Jury was fantastically proactive about this when I suggested it to him, that that's not just a social omission, but actually the diversity of our population have economic, political, uh, social connections to fast growing economic regions of the world where they probably want many of the products that we develop in Bristol. You know, green technology, communications, digital. The, the, these things will be attractive if we begin to really revel in the diversity of our, our population and the connectivity it has to the globe and fast growing economic regions and international markets. So it's an, so it an absolute asset. So, uh, you know, I would welcome, I, I just want to say again, we are an international city. I welcome you. I welcome the contribution you make to, uh, to making sure that this is what we are and that we proactively uh, develop uh, our culture as a city that thrives in its difference and its diversity because that's what makes us interesting, that's the future of the world. I just say, when I was a, um, a reporter at BBC, Radio Bristol, this is not a crack at Radio Bristol, but it was seemed that so much of the storytelling at Radio Bristol was based on a geographical sense of identity, geographical sense of self. And my refrain was constantly, look guys, we're local but we're not parochial. Many people in Bristol don't just live their lives within the geographical region of the west of England. They are international people. The things that are, when we had a hurricane in the West Indies, there were many people that were touched in Bristol. You know, when there's a drought in parts of the world, there are many people that are touched in Bristol because we live internationally. And I think just, just live, thriving in that, drawing that out, will just make us a much uh, richer city. And I think it will secure our prosperity. And, and uh, yeah, I think, I, I think we can only benefit from that. So thank you. Please stay committed to Bristol. I hope that many, many of you continue to live here. We have to contend with the house prices if you do, but we'll deal with that, all right? <laughs> but uh, I'm building houses, that's the idea. Uh, so uh, I, d I do hope that you, you, you stay and you stay committed. You, you get people to come here and that we can just ferociously pursue, pursue the vision of the city that uh, I think we'd all share. Thank you. Thank you.